Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Canadian COVID cases are back on the rise. It's nothing short of alarming. Where it's happening and what you need to know before Canada's second pandemic winter. The biggest risk is probably not when you're sitting in the seat. It's when you're lining up for the concession stand or for the bathroom or you're jammed onto an escalator. Advice on how to gauge your risk. Also tonight, what happened when two embryos were allegedly swapped? The baby that I thought to bring into this world was not mine to keep. The family suing over an in vitro mix-up. And oh my God. from a rare tornado to a string of damaging weather bombs, what is going on in BC? This is The National. Public health officials have predicted a bumpy pandemic road ahead as more activities move indoors. Well, tonight, it looks like those bumps have arrived. Thanks to new hotspots, Canada's overall case rate is on the rise. Now, that rise in average daily new cases isn't happening in every province, but Ontario and Quebec's are up around 40% from the lows they hit last month in Manitoba. The bump is more like 90% to levels not seen since June. And from lows hit just over two weeks ago, average daily new cases in Nova Scotia are up 282%. More on Nova Scotia in a moment, but first, Thomas Degler looks at Canada's pandemic picture as we head into winter when vaccines clash with variants during the coming season of gatherings in enclosed spaces. This could be Ontario's clearest sign yet lifting all COVID restrictions within months might be harder than first thought. It's nothing short of alarming, not just the number of cases that we're experiencing, but the rate of rise. Very concerned about our public health system capacity. Sudbury is suffering a sudden spike in cases and reimposing masking rules and capacity limits, while across Ontario, we look still okay, we're in a good place, but we're on the wrong trajectory. Thank you guys. He's pointing to simple measures that seem to be slipping, like having fans wear masks at indoor sports and ensuring restaurant staff are checking proof of vaccination. If things get worse, the health minister warns Ontario could still slow its grand reopening in the new year. It is potentially possible, but we do know that there are going to be increases in cases as the weather turns colder, and that has been brought into the equation. Across Canada, there are pockets of concern. Reminders, strong nationwide vaccine uptake isn't enough to snuff out the Delta variant. It is especially important for us all to remain vigilant now. Quebec is again seeing case counts creep upward, and in Manitoba, the rise is even more steep. Yukon is declaring a state of emergency, fearing the health care system could quickly become overwhelmed. We have 90% of eligible people first dose coverage. It's not enough. Many Canadians might be making bigger holiday plans this year, but public health officials stress some caution may still be required. Since people are indoors and interacting indoors, those places that don't have that high vaccine rates are going to see the virus one way or another. There's plenty to look forward to now. Overall, Canada is still faring well. The fear is, as hope is rising, vigilance is falling. And there's still a need for both. Okay, so Thomas, given that, what are the public health experts watching for next? They're going to be watching for any sign of exponential growth, Adrian. That's when case counts quickly double and then double again, and that's when alarm bells start going off. We were speaking today with the scientific director of the advisory table here in Ontario, and he said within about two and a half weeks, this province could be seeing a thousand cases a day. That would be the first time that happened since last spring. Public health experts are just using this moment to tell people, remember personal vigilance because uh, no one wants to see explosive growth in case counts as the temperatures go down. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas Degla in Toronto tonight. Health Canada has opened the door for wider use of boosters, approving a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for anyone 18 and over. Now, the actual rollout will depend on what provinces decide, and several have already approved boosters for certain high-risk populations. And today, Quebec cast a wider net. For the moment, people that are age 70 and over can receive a booster dose if they wish, respecting an interval of at least six months since the last dose. 
There have been signs of waning immunity in the elderly. So as you heard, everyone 70 and up will be able to get a booster with a phased rollout starting with those aged 80 and up. That begins next week. Now, Nova Scotia is already rolling out boosters to residents in long-term care and not a moment too soon. That spike of infections in the province we mentioned earlier, Kayla Hounslow explains it has already made its way into a long-term care home. Crystal McKinnon lives in Calgary. Her father lives in long-term care in Nova Scotia. She already felt disconnected. Then she got a call that made things worse. They told me that there was an outbreak and that they were isolating residents and they were doing swabs and tests. 17 residents and two staff members at the East Cumberland Lodge in Pugwash have tested positive. One resident is in hospital. Despite having high rates of vaccination among long-term care residents and staff, the fourth wave of COVID-19 pandemic is still having serious impact. Public Health says a staff member was the first infected, but won't say whether that person was vaccinated. All of the residents have had two doses, though none have had booster shots. 96% of staff have proven they're fully vaccinated. And as of the end of the month, vaccination will be mandatory for healthcare workers in Nova Scotia. I think it's too little too late, quite honestly. I believe that uh, across the country, if you're a close contact health care worker, you should have been vaccinated. Public Health says the outbreak at the long-term care home is linked to a faith-based gathering that included 100 people over multiple days. And there's been ongoing transmission from um, individuals who are, who are ill there. Public Health says there are high rates of unvaccinated people in the faith communities involved. People don't have to prove they're vaccinated to attend regular church services because they're considered essential. But that doesn't apply to larger events like the one linked to this outbreak. I'm just getting tired of hearing about people complain about their right to choose instead of making the right choice, which is get vaccinated for the good of the country. After this interview, she learned the real weight of that choice. Her dad's COVID test came back positive. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole can't seem to escape questions about MPs in his caucus who've been vocally opposed to vaccine mandates, some even raising doubts about how well the shots work. Travis Danrat shows us what's at stake and why it may be so important to get under control. Today, I'm proud to announce the Conservative Shadow Cabinet. Aaron O'Toole wanted to talk about his front bench today. Instead, the Conservative leader was once again batting down questions about those on the back benches. When will the leader start to crack some heads in his caucus and remind his caucus that vaccines are safe and that his caucus shouldn't be running around the country saying otherwise? We think to tackle vaccine hesitancy, you have to be straight, you have to take down the temperature. But things are still heated in his own caucus. Last month, former Conservative leadership candidate and now MP Leslin Lewis questioned the purpose of giving children the shot. Niagara West MP Dean Allison hosted a discussion featuring people who've said those who had COVID don't need the vaccine. And Sarnia's Marilyn Gladue said this in an interview with CTV. In terms of the risk, uh, people that got polio, many of them died and many of them were crippled. And that is not the same frequency of uh, risk that we see with COVID-19. Today, a retraction. Upon reflection, Gladu said, the comments amounted to dangerous misinformation. She also encouraged people to get vaccinated. But Gladu is leading a group of MPs inside the Conservative Party calling themselves the Civil Liberties Caucus to look into, among other things, accommodations for those who choose not to get vaccinated. Some Conservative watchers say O'Toole needs to get tough on such sentiment. There's been an inability to do so, which is why we have this ongoing coverage, this ongoing distraction. And yes, you know, obviously it's difficult for leaders to say you can't have an internal caucus, like that is a challenge, but at the end of the day, there needs to be some discipline. Aaron O'Toole has still not disclosed how many of his MPs remain unvaccinated, and that could prolong the distraction as we inch closer to the return of Parliament on November 22nd. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. NHL star Carey Price is speaking out tonight on what prompted him to step away from the game more than a month ago. 
The 34-year-old posted this message on his Instagram. He says he made the decision to enter the NHL's assistance program due to substance abuse. Price says he is working through years of neglecting his mental health and thanks fans for support. In British Columbia, people are dying from drug overdoses in greater numbers than ever before. So far this year, overdose deaths in the province have hit a historic high. And as Brady Strachan explains, experts are pointing to two major factors, a toxic drug supply and the pandemic. And more digitally of Ryan than Tyler. Helen Jennings feels the devastating impact of the opioid epidemic every day. The BC mother lost both her sons, Tyler and Ryan, to drug overdoses. It's a horrible thing to have watched and to fight for the solutions and to see the death rates, you know, climbing. And now Jennings is part of a nationwide advocacy group called Mum Stop the Harm. They want a safer drug supply, among other things. But this province's opioid crisis is only escalating. Heroin has all but disappeared from the market now, the illicit market. So, and fentanyl is, is a, a drug of choice for many, many people. BC's chief coroner says already this year, more than 1,500 people have died of a drug overdose, a record that puts BC on pace to surpass the record set last year by nearly 25%. There are families suffering in every community, uh, so much loss. The powerful opioid fentanyl is the main driver. It's been found in the systems of 85% of people who overdosed this year. Another factor, the pandemic that's keeping people apart. Many deaths have happened among those using drugs alone in their homes. Hey, hey, hey. Kevin Yake has lost many friends to overdoses during the pandemic. We um, always pre told people to never use alone to be with somebody, you know, like... And um, then the COVID-19 came along. He too wants to see more harm reduction measures for drug users, like a faster expansion of the province's safe drug supply program. The province says it's working towards those solutions with the opening of hundreds of recovery beds. And last week, BC applied to Ottawa to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of drugs. Measures advocates say can't come soon enough. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna, British Columbia. BC is also reeling from some pretty harsh weather. Tens of thousands had their power knocked out overnight after yet another severe blast. Susanna Da Silva on what's behind it all. And all of a sudden, the wind just came out of nowhere, and I felt some debris hit the house. I felt the house shake. And then, boom. The latest storm brought down this massive tree, smashed this car, and knocked out power to a handful of houses, one of several areas left in the dark last night. The whole wind event didn't last more than 60 seconds. It was very brief, came out of nowhere, and then it was over. We're bundled up, and uh, it could be worse. No loss of life. Vancouver's weather has been wildly extreme this fall. Four atmospheric rivers, three bomb cyclones and a tornado at UBC this weekend. Fortunately, no one was injured. Vancouverites used to rain have dealt with rainfall levels 200% of normal, while record-breaking wind events have caused chaos. Seriously, I think, especially this year, it is crazy this year what's happening here. The jet stream has been very potent. It's bringing, it's been bringing parades of storms to the coast. It all has experts taking note. Seeing upwards of 20 millimeters an hour on the outside coast for an hour here and there is fairly normal during an atmospheric river, but seeing three or four hours like that is, is really a head scratcher. And so, yeah, generally speaking, things have gotten a little bit heightened. Heightened now in terms of rain and wind, but less than five months ago, it was high heat. And while this is a La Nina winter, which can create stormier conditions, scientists are looking at what else could be at play. Climate change means that every weather event is supercharged in a way. I mean, our baseline has already shifted with the warming that we've seen. So we already are getting more of our rain and snow in these bigger events rather than spread out. And with winter still to come and a storm this weekend, experts are telling people to better prepare for emergencies and enjoy the pleasant moments when they come. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver.
Well, the COP26 summit is in its final stretch with just days left to go for world leaders to come up with final climate plans and promises. Today saw a push to address the inequalities women and girls face as a result of climate change. But as Chris Brown tells us, gloomy new research overshadowed much of the agenda. The Glasgow summit is arriving at a crucial moment, and civil society groups want to make sure they're not forgotten. A giant puppet representing a little Syrian refugee girl underscored that women cannot be left behind as economies transition to a greener future. And as Indigenous women remembered those missing and murdered, they said the priority can't only be about jobs. We can't be looking at ways to save the economy. We actually have to look at ways to save the environment and the planet. COP26's lead organizer said enormous work remains to find a global consensus on lowering emissions. We are making progress at COP26, but we still have a mountain to climb over the next few days. A report out today says the gap between what's needed to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and what's been promised is vast. The new pledges here would still lead to a 2.4 degree increase by the end of the century. The authors even named the underachievers. Like Australia, or even worse, have submitted a less ambitious target than the first target that they put forward, which seems to be the case with Brazil. <laughs> At 2.4 degrees, extreme weather events will become commonplace, says this Bangladeshi climate scientist. The implications of 1.5 are bad for Bangladesh. The implications of 2.4 are bad for you in Canada. He means even more heat waves that spark extreme fires, such as the one that tore through Lytton, B.C. this past summer. The physics of the climate is going its own way, and it's not impressed by the things that we think are good, that we are doing. A draft of a possible final agreement comes out Wednesday, but if even one out of 200 countries here objects, then there will have to be changes. The weaker the commitment to cut emissions, the more likely it is it will be accepted. Chris Brown, CBC News, Glasgow. And as COP26 continues tomorrow, we are going to shift our focus to the cities that so many Canadians live in. Cities are both largely responsible for and punished by the effects of climate change. People know this, they see it happening, and they know there's something wrong. So as world leaders gather in Glasgow, who are the people working on a local scale to adjust to a climate that has already changed? Livable heat inside the building for four days after the power has gone out. Absolutely, and, and the thing about that is that all of our buildings can be like this. From smarter building design to smarter ways of doing things we already do. Originally, you were filling six to seven dumpster bins a week. a week. You managed to get all of that down to one dumpster per month. Per month. That's tomorrow on The National. Let's turn to the dramatic story unfolding on the borders of Belarus. Thousands of migrants are camped out trying to leave. As Briar Stewart shows us, European leaders say they're being used as pawns as countries play politics. <laughs> It's an increasingly desperate standoff. Some migrants tried to break through a fence along the Poland-Belarus border and were sprayed with an unidentified substance by a line of Polish soldiers. Others huddle around fires or shiver in the forest, stranded between countries, entrapped in a growing political confrontation. We don't have water, don't have food. How many times are we waiting? I don't know. We don't know. Aid groups say at least 10 people have died in recent months, and it's only going to get colder. Attention, attention. The police inform. Destruction of border infrastructure is forbidden. You will face criminal charges. Używa civili. Poland's prime minister accused Belarus of using migrants as human shields by luring desperate people to the country and promising transport to the border, a gateway to the European Union. EU officials say Belarus is trying to direct migrants into the EU as retribution for sanctions levied against the country's authoritarian government, 
Does Lukashenko regime starts to behave as a gangster regime because it's hurting them and they don't know what else to do, so they try to undermine the European Union. But aid groups say Poland isn't blameless. They are also lying to them. Polish soldiers have been pushing migrants back into Belarus, which this humanitarian worker says is against international law. They are using force uh, or threaten people to get back on the Belarusian side. Some who've been wandering in the forest for days end up going along with border guards to a detention center because they're cold, hungry, and have no options left. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Moscow. Well, a California woman says she gave birth to another couple's baby after a mix-up at the fertility clinic. The baby that I thought to bring into this world was not mine to keep. Ahead tonight, how they managed to get their actual baby back. What happens after the storm to the vulnerable bearing the brunt of climate change? My bedroom is all mold and mildew. I can't stay in it. But up next, ahead of another pandemic winter, we test the air. As we go inside, it'll pick up more carbon as more people are breathing, which means there could be more virus in the air. How do we move inside safely? That story in just two minutes. Another painful chapter is developing in this country's reckoning with the effects of residential schools. A search for missing children just got underway at a site in Brantford, Ontario. The coming months will be definitely difficult for Six Nations. All told, more than 200 hectares of land once associated with the Mohawk Institute Residential School will be searched. Teams began using ground-penetrating radar this afternoon. In Labrette, Saskatchewan, another search began yesterday at the site of the former Capel Residential School. Well, we all remember our first pandemic winter. Thanks to mass vaccinations, this year will be different. But with the Delta variant still out there and restrictions loosening, how do you gauge risk for you and your family? Christine Birak, get some advice. No one wants another COVID winter, but it's coming. And doctors say this one will be trickier. Not everyone is vaccinated, Delta is far more contagious than the original virus, and indoor air is riskier than anyone had thought last winter. This whole pandemic has turned aerosol science on its head. Scientists say people can release tiny infected particles while talking or just breathing. They can travel farther than two meters and linger in the air for hours. Good ventilation can suck them out. However, it's hard to know if a space is well ventilated, but there are clues. This is carbon dioxide data. Jeffrey Siegel is an air quality expert. He's been monitoring the carbon dioxide that people exhale in various spaces. And you can see as people come into the office in the morning, there's these big spikes. The gas builds up in indoor spaces that are not well ventilated. Those steep drops are key. That tells us what the ventilation system is doing to remove the carbon dioxide and the other things that people are breathing out in the space. Things like the virus. The U.S. CDC notes one potential target benchmark for good ventilation is carbon dioxide readings below 800 parts per million. Out here in the fresh air, the carbon detector is in the 300s because it's fresh air. But as we go inside, it'll pick up more carbon as more people are breathing, which means there could be more virus in the air. Not scientific, but we took a carbon dioxide monitor for a subway ride in Toronto. It climbed to over 700 with few riders on board. Small busy restaurants can hit well over eight. We also checked out the entry gate to Scotiabank Arena ahead of a Leafs game. Over 700, but still well ventilated. The biggest risk is probably not when you're sitting in the seat. It's when you're lining up for the concession stand or for the bathroom or you're jammed onto an escalator. like. Those are the highest risk spaces. Closed, crowded spaces remain the riskiest infection spots. Experts say when we move indoors, we need layers of protection. Along with ventilation, we know that vaccines, masks, and physical distancing can prevent the spread of this virus. In Europe, another wave of COVID cases and deaths is now surging, largely fueled by low vaccination rates, dropped measures, and pandemic fatigue. Experts insist as seasons change, immunity from vaccines could wane and hard lessons learned should not be forgotten. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. 
Next, we'll take you to a city that's been battered by extreme weather. My bedroom is all mold and mildew. I can't stay in it. What happens to the vulnerable living on the front lines of climate change? And later. It was scary. I've been in water with every kind of shark, but this is a scary shark. The moment two divers spotted one of these off the coast of Nova Scotia. Welcome back. Tonight, our continuing coverage of our changing planet looks at the effects of climate change in a hard-hit city already struggling with other problems. Lake Charles, Louisiana, has been ravaged by extreme weather, but recovery never seems to come evenly. Chris Reyes looks at how race and poverty play into that. Everywhere you turn in the city of 80,000 people, there's a similar scene of destruction and desperation. From two unforgiving years of extreme weather, first Hurricane Laura, then Hurricane Delta, then an ice storm, most recently a tornado, forcing tens of thousands from their homes. On the surface, it seems like Mother Nature's wrath is random. So this is where we actually had a lot of black businesses. But talk to Tasha Guidry, and she's quick to correct you. I always say that natural disasters don't discriminate, but recovery always does. And that's what it means to live in cities like Lake Charles, a community on the front lines of extreme climate. In this city, the hardest hit neighborhoods are mostly black, Latino, and poor. Just last year, a row of Black-owned businesses stood here. Most of them were either underinsured or the damage was too extensive for them to not be able to rebuild. Tasha describes Lake Charles like as a, a city divided. Every time we're hit with a storm, it's always our areas that are hit the hardest, and we're the ones with the least amount of, of relief, you know, monetary or financial relief, in order to rebuild. We, we don't have the hope anymore that we used to. And it makes it hard for us to want to have to rebuild and reinvest in our community because it seems as if nobody else cares. Does it anger you that this is an empty field and just, you know, another part of town, it's, it's rebuilt like new? Oh, absolutely. In Tasha's neighborhood, all we saw were demolitions, blue tarps, red tags. This was once a family-owned auto repair shop. We've been promised economic development, but we're not seeing anyone wanting to come to North Lake Charles to want to invest in it, to revitalize it. Leaving isn't an option for the most vulnerable in public housing. I'm tired. Bridget Reed has cancer and has nowhere to go. My immune system is not up. I stay back and forth in the hospital. Behind this, 58 years old. Been staying here six years, but they don't want to help me. They saying they don't have another unit to put me in. Right now we're seeing the mold and mildew. Her daughter invited us in to see for ourselves what the hurricanes left behind. My bedroom is all mold and mildew. I can't stay in it. I've called the mayor. I've called um, Baton Rouge for the governor. I've just been making a lot of calls. And nobody's helping. Nobody's reaching out to me. Bridget is one of many in this state that hugs the Gulf Coast. They bear the burden of extreme weather. Louisiana has one of the highest poverty rates in the country. We met Louisiana's governor on the same day he was leaving for Glasgow for COP26. What do you plan to tell the world at COP26 about women like Bridget, many of whom live in your state, who are at the front lines of extreme climate? Yeah, well obviously, you know, I, I was just talking about unmet need and, and the unmet need is, is typically the needs of poor people 
uh, who don't own their own homes, or if they do, they can't afford insurance. And so when you have these severe weather uh, events that cause catastrophic damage, uh, they typically are the ones who suffer the most. Louisiana is in a rut. Beverly Wright says politicians are still moving too slow. For decades, she's watched them fail vulnerable communities. Why is nobody listening to them when we know that they're going to be directly impacted by the extreme climate that's coming, that's already here? Um, there's a long and complicated answer to that question, but also a simple one, racism. You have to remember where we are. We're in the deep South with a, with a Confederate culture. They respond to maintain the status quo, however it is, and um, they play to the, the people who don't believe that there's climate change. They're going to be all right. No matter what, they're going to be all right. All of this is made up. You know, they're exaggerating. If these storms continue, that's exactly Deacon Errol DeVille will tell you there's no exaggerating what he's witnessed in the last two years. I mean, these storms aren't coming every 50 years. These, I mean, no, no, it, they so are coming to... way more often now. Uh, and you just have to live with it. I'll, I'll move, and, and, yeah. and these people can't move. This parish will die. You know, the city is not going to die, but it's going to, you know, it's going to go into a decline. Convincing people to rebuild is tough when everywhere you look, there's rubble. It's been surreal. And, uh, to know that the response has not been there. Unfortunately for us, we just keep going and we hope that the help does come eventually. Every time it rains. Until then, Tasha says she'll keep talking to anyone who will listen, even if it means showing the harsh realities of the place she calls home. For us to be the poster child of natural disasters, absolutely. Can we take another one? No, we can't. For that reason, Tasha says she refuses to give up. She's hoping her community will do the same. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Well, coming up next, honoring their sacrifices through the power of music. I think of sort of the story and the trenches and sort of bullets flying and rockets exploding. How these piano students are connecting to veterans right after the break. Welcome back. A piano teacher in Victoria is using music to connect her students with those we honor on Remembrance Day. The teens she teaches have each written an original piece of music for a member of the Canadian Armed Forces. Lindsay Duncombe shows us the moments the compositions are shared. I think of sort of the story and the trenches and sort of bullets flying and rockets exploding and sort of this very... Um, vivid scene. The name of this original composition is Outcry. I sort of based it off of like a, a battle cry. 16-year-old Kai Stenson composed the piece for Corporal Steve Last, who spent more than two decades in service. I think it's important for us to understand and learn about the past and what these people have done for our country and other countries. 33 veterans and current members of the Canadian Armed Forces will receive personalized piano compositions from BC music students this Remembrance Day. Victoria piano teacher Emily Armour came up with the idea. Because I think on Remembrance Day, um, we, look at, we look at the big picture, which is great, but in that big picture is a lot of individual people. Um, and I was hoping it would give the kids a chance to connect with something really real on on. Remembrance Day. Hi, my name is Ainsley McPherson. I composed this piece called The Lancaster's Flight. Which is this one, composed for retired pilot Graham Hafey. I think it must force the students or get them to think really deeply about it in order to actually compose something um, where the feeling that they have about Remembrance Day comes out in the form of music. I think it's really profound, actually. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. The youngest student, a boy named Sullivan, was matched with Cold War era reservist Troy Latimer. It's actually very humbling um, that this little fella here would uh, 
you know, take the time to do something like that. It's emotional for the students, too. My piece is for a veteran that has passed away and is being sent to his wife. 16-year-old Lola Kotke wanted her song to be hopeful. It's really put it in perspective for me that there's still a lot of stuff like this going on in the world today and that we still need to remember the people who have passed recently and the people who are still in, in it, right? A lesson now felt as much as learned. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Victoria. Some lovely gestures there. Okay, unlike last year when COVID-19 kept so many people home, this year crowds will be welcome at the National War Memorial on Thursday and Chief Political Correspondent Rosemary Barton will be there hosting our live coverage of the Remembrance Day ceremony. You can watch on CBC Television or CBC News Network starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. Remembrance Day often sparks conversations about wartime memories, but not all of them come from veterans. Kitty Nicholson takes us to a long-term care home in northern Toronto where stories about internment camps on Canadian soil are being told to the next generation for the very first time. And a warning, some of the language you'll hear is offensive. Five, B, eight. Bingo! Sukai and Yoshie Siyama first crossed paths long before they ended up in the same long-term care home. You'd have to go back 80 years and thousands of kilometers away to their shared dark history as student and teacher at the same Japanese-Canadian internment camp in Kaslo, BC. And while some memories have faded with age, others remain fresh, like Kai's teaching style. Oh, you used to be such a strict teacher. Well, I didn't realize it, but I think it's better to be strict. And we always have a good laugh. <laughs> that was a little bread. <laughs> and there are other memories that stubbornly persist. Sometimes at the middle of the night, I said, oh, I, I have a nightmare. Experiences and feelings long repressed to protect her son, Brian Kai. Well, I think there were times when my parents didn't want, want to talk about it. And when that happened, they spoke Japanese, and since I couldn't understand it. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. One Sunday, everybody's going crazy. Bomb, 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 bomb. And then I heard, no, you better go inside because they're going to shoot you. That terror was real. Amid strong anti-Japanese sentiment, 21,000 Japanese Canadians were ordered from the BC coast further inland. Kai's family was to be split up. Carrying a rice cooker and sewing machine, they left the downtown Vancouver home her father built with his own two hands and joined thousands of others forced into the BC interior. No newspaper, no radio, no another world company. We didn't even know what's going on into the war. Yoshie Suyama was just 14 when she was sent to Kaslo. We only moved because they kicked us out. Japs out when the war started. What was that like to be told you had to leave New Westminster? Well, we had to leave. We couldn't say yes or no. It was not something that we talked about. And I just think that it was um, maybe too painful for them to relive those memories. At 17, Jane Zielinski's father, Herb Sakaguchi, was shipped off to Slocan, B.C. We lost our house. Kids and I know, as a matter of fact, it's a nice place, you know. The government sold their Kitsilano home from under them. In 1988, Canada compensated internment camp survivors. $21,000, a pittance compared to today's Vancouver real estate prices. They did it. We got evacuated. I'm still around. Mad as hell, but what can I do? It's finished now. Who are these people? Here, after decades, long withheld anger and thwarted dreams expressed out loud for the first time. I was mad. I was mad, yeah. 
uh, and then the, I, I plan to go to university. That's the first time I actually heard her say the word mad the, to the fact that she had to be moved into internment camps. Is this Uncle Ray? That's your brother. No, that's me. That's okay. you? That's you. Feelings better expressed late than never. After long, successful, and happy lives, they had to rebuild from scratch. Heidi Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next, a California couple is suing a fertility clinic over an apparent life-changing mix-up. Our biological child was given to someone else. They say they raised someone else's baby after the wrong embryo was implanted. How they got their child back, next. Welcome back. A Canadian teen who was in the crowd during Friday's deadly Astro World Music Festival described some of the heartbreaking chaos on CBC News Network today. There's actually a point where this girl collapsed like into my arms. She's beside me, and um, she looked at me and she said, "Am I gonna die?" And I just I couldn't answer because yeah, yeah, yeah it's really I don't know. I just I didn't want to give her false hope. Eight people were killed after fans pushed forward while performer Travis Scott was on stage in Houston, Texas. More than a dozen lawsuits have now been filed. Well, now to a shocking story out of California where a couple says their memories of childbirth will always be tainted following an alleged mix-up during in vitro fertilization. Chris Glover explains what happened after they found out the baby wasn't theirs. What was supposed to be one of the happiest moments of Alexander Cardinali's life, meeting his new baby, happened four months late thanks to an apparent mix-up. I was in some kind of hell. And it was just getting worse. In 2019, his wife Daphna gave birth to a baby that looked nothing like them. They'd used in vitro fertilization and immediately feared something had gone wrong. I think we were hoping if at least one of us was was genetically related to her, then we could keep her. But I think the biggest f fear in all of this is like, am I gonna lose my baby? <laughs> According to their lawsuit, three months baby? later, genetic testing showed their embryo had been switched with another couple's. The solution legally exchanged the children. And our biological child was given to someone else. And the baby that I fought to bring into this world was not mine to keep. The couple is suing their LA fertility doctor, clinic, and lab. The other family wants to remain anonymous, but reportedly plans to sue as well. While cases like this have happened in the US before, they are exceedingly rare. But accidents happen, mistakes happen. Fertility lawyer Sherry Levitin says the miraculous thing here is both women successfully gave birth and agreed to switch the babies. I understand that there are a hundred different horrible outcomes, and this was the least horrible of all those outcomes. The Cardinalis say their pain is eclipsed by that of their older daughter. As this ordeal has taken away everything that feels safe and has shaken her trust in us as parents. Who can't possibly understand why she lost the little sister she'd grown to love. Chris Glover, CBC News, Washington. Up next, a close encounter of the aquatic kind. Mike's smiling. I don't know why. This was scary as shit. Well, there you go. A seasoned diver takes a swim and meets something unexpected. You are looking at a great white shark off the coast of Mexico. Kind of a gorgeous photo snapped by a very experienced diver from Nova Scotia. This is important because today, to his surprise, he saw another great white while on a dive, but this time in the water outside Halifax. His reaction moments after that sighting is tonight's moment. It was scary. I've been in water with every kind of shark, but this is a scary shark and a scary scene. He was above us, so we were below looking up, and you could see him silhouetted right on the bottom, just cruising. They saw a shark go by right out at the edge of visibility. Signaled to Mike, his head was turned. Shark came back for a second pass. It was about a 10 foot long great white shark. You could distinctly see the header circle tail. You could see the counter shading. You could see the very distinctive snout. 
and muzzle. We know they're around because I get them on my receiver just up the coast. We're a kilometer from a seal colony. It's a no-brainer. We had a big seal with a huge stake taken out of its back up in Duncan's Cove. So we know the sharks are around, but I thought they'd have left by now. We made it back to the uh, descent line, came up, got out of the water as fast as we could. I let Mike get out first because he's younger, less expendable than me. And then I got out and uh, we're just catching our breath. Yeah, well, I am. I'm old. He's young. <laughs> anyway, what an amazing experience. Neither of them are expendable. Let's, no, let's just no say kidding. that for the record. But and, and we should also say they're not inexperienced, right? Chris has done more than 3,000 dives. Mike, an elite military diver. They just, as they say, didn't expect to see sharks this time of year. So they were so certain they weren't going to see them in part because of the rough weather. They left their cameras on the yeah. boat deck. And I, I'm pretty sure they're like, ugh. <laughs> That is a national for November the 9th. Good night. Good night.